Thank you very much for the, that very uh, generous introduction. I think it might have been a bit too generous. I hope I can somehow live, live up to it partly. So I think as we begin, um, well, a few people have already said that they'd rather have a healing session, I think, than probably another talk. You know, it might be that time of year or whatever. But maybe we need to clear, clear ourselves a bit because we are, we are talking, we're talking about massage. We're talking, uh, um, incidentally, uh, by default with me about osteopathy, acupuncture, the various other things that are, that are part of my life as well. And this, this word here, which is uh, perhaps the key, shamanism, shamanism, whatever way we, we wish to pronounce it. So, but let's begin. So maybe you want to close your eyes, maybe you don't. person must have a soft gabesi. Well, that's Bradford Keeney. I'm not Bradford Keeney. Um, and I've never met Bradford. I've uh, communicated a lot by email. We've had a lot of conversations. What I'm going to talk about has a lot to do with him, and it doesn't have a lot to do with him. That was a very interesting piece for many reasons, and I'll, I will come back to it. Um, there's, there's a lot in that which I think we should carry with us. A lot of the the energy and a lot of the intention. It was a little bit quiet, in fact, but there was a little bit of there when he shot an arrow. I don't know if you heard him say that, but he said, and we can shoot the arrow. <laughs> it's like energy. I don't know if you feel it, but when I, when, I, when I do that, it actually reminds me of shooting arrows, but it's, it's the whole body speaking, and it's one relationship being set up between a person and another person in a particular way. So if this is all about relationships between bodies and people and ways of working with those relationships in a particular environment, a particular cultural setting. So let's just go back to who we're talking about, just so that we're all on the same page. So Southern Africa, six countries where the San or Bushmen live. There's 130,000 of them. Uh, they are linked genetically, historically, to the Khoikhoi or Nama. There's about 200,000 Nama living mainly in Namibia. The Bushmen live over this area here, and there's, there's different groups, and they speak different languages, something in the region of 13 languages, depending on how you define the differences. So this is, this is just examples of a, a few different Bushmen Groups. So that's a typical picture that you can pull off the internet. So this is someone who's been out to see the Bushmen and they've gone on a, 
a living museum experience where they dress up and they recreate their sort of traditional hunting lives, which a lot of them were living until the 1950s up in that region. Now, they are still hunting, and this is a group of hunters that I was with a few months ago, and we were actually recording films for the museum I'm setting up, um, or we've set up. Um, there's another chap, Basa Bow, down in the corner there, who also worked with Bradford Keeney. I mean, there, there are lots of connections here. This is our museum reference group, in fact. Um, and that's the mother of the leader of the Chunkwanzi. So it's, it's really just to give us, a, give us a feel of who we're talking about. So most people now, they'll be living in something that, OK, that's another traditional village set up, but people do still live in grass huts like that, up in, certainly up in Namibia, northern Namibia. But they'll probably be living in something like that or something like that, perhaps working on a farm where they're living, you can't see it that clearly, but in a you know, very basic farm dwelling. And people who are doing very well might be living in a brick house with a tin roof. Very few Bushmen uh, are part of the whole um, big capitalist movement, dream, whatever. Um, they've been marginalized, disenfranchised. There are now people who are coming through university and are gathering money and they are moving into towns and they are uh, living lives that would be a lot more familiar, but most people are living sort of somewhere in between shanty towns and, and out in the bush. So what I really want to say to you is that massage is a primary healthcare strategy of the Bushmen. Now, that's not something that's generally recognized. In fact, I don't know of anyone else that has thought about massage really with the Bushmen. Um, and in some ways, this, this is what this is all about. And it's no coincidence that I've picked up on it. So what I want to say is that to understand massage, you have to place it in this overall context of shamanic healing and I'll come back to what the shamanic healing means amongst the Bushmen but also to understand shamanic healing so the stuff Bradford Keeney is dealing with and many others you have to understand not just other healing strategies but the whole location of the ideas the movements the history and this is also where I think I'm coming at it from a, a bigger picture there's a big tendency for, I think for all of us academics, to launch in, get right into our tight field, and close off to all the other information. And it's partly because there is so much information out there um, that it's, it's extremely difficult to become um, certainly interdisciplinarian. Uh, but it's also that we all come at life as blinkers. Now, arguably, my blinkers were coming at life from this sort of post-osteopathic uh, environment. But at the same time, I've been pushing you know, w my understandings of, of body human relationships, nature relationships, and that's the only way I've understood what they're doing. So the strange thing was that um, when people went out to study the Bushmen, they, they, it was very specific what they saw. Perhaps it's not strange at all. Again, it goes back to what you know. So they either recorded things that are familiar or things that were exotic. And this changed through time. So the first people to go out, the, the earliest settlers, uh, so earliest visitors were at the end of the 15th century, the Portuguese, but they didn't really generate any information. So information started coming out from European visitors to the Cape in 16, 1650s onwards through to 1700 was when you really started getting uh, published information. And this was... Uh, drawn from people living around the Cape. So these were people who were then described as Hottentots. Uh, they would now be described as Khoi Khoi. Uh, they, some of them would be Bushmen. Now the difference between a Bushman and a Hottentot is a very uh, complicated, well it's not so complicated, but controversial topic. Hunter-gatherers and herders. The Bushmen are the hunter-gatherers and the Khoi Khoi are the herders. But, the, but at, in those early times, a lot of people made no distinction whatsoever. And it wasn't really until the about 1800 when people were starting to say oh this person is a bushman and that meant a slightly different thing then and this person is a hottentot um, so, so what they started recording when they went out there was what they found as familiar and the most familiar thing was herbal remedies so there are there are lists of sort of plants that were used um, poultices 
how broken limbs were set. They also looked at animal-based remedies. Now, this is another thing that people talked about in, well, anywhere from about sort of 1650 through to 1800. And animal re remedies were more commonly used in Europe at that time, so people were more familiar with them. Um, so they wrote about them then. But then later academics going out there, researchers, travelers, that really dropped off their interest in animal remedies. They, they wrote about plant remedies mainly. Other things, bleeding, now with bleeding in European, early European medical culture, that was a familiar thing, so they wrote about bleeding. And then later, so uh, in the 1800s, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s really, they started talking about this sort of primitive inoculation. And this is where you get a cut and you rub something into it and it, it makes someone better or changes them. So people called this primitive inoculation, which was an inappropriate thing to call it because it has to be judged on its own terms. Um, then they wrote about exotic things and there's lots of commentary about people rubbing themselves in fat and they say the smellier the fat the better so they used fish oil they used sheep intestines they talk about people walking around with sheep intestines around them and they wear them until they drop off they just sort of rot around them and of course there was a lot of uh, colonial bias in all of this uh, and ep a, a lot of classical ways of thinking about the other um, that were draw drawn into their narratives um, and the other things, antidote for poisons. There's been a huge colonial fascination on, on poisons and how you can get antidotes for them. So that's been written about a lot. Moon worship, when they first went out, so again in the late 1600s, they were saying, do these people have any religion at all? They have nothing. Um, do they worship the moon? Uh, and then as time went on, they talked about the magicians working in the communities and then conjurers. And this was where the first sort of talk about medicine men and healers started. And then as time goes on, you suddenly get this conversation about a new sort of kind of healing. Well, in fact, these people are, are shamanic healers. And that really started in the, the 1980s. So first indications of shamanism. Now, in the San context, it really equates to what's known as the, the trance dance or the healing dance, which I've talked, talked to you about before. So just very, very quickly, and um, we, we'll look at some in a minute. The, the healing dance is all about the community coming together. There'll be one, two, maybe a few more healers. The community surrounds them either sitting or standing. And the central dancer, he dances, he draws up energy or she inside themselves. It tends to be men. Uh, and then that energy is spread out amongst the community to heal people. So you either put energy into people and you pull out or you pull out the sickness it's a combination of the two and you work around the whole group so it's a very egalitarian uh, type of healing so the first sort of indications of any sort of dancing that kind of fitted that description uh, was from this chap Robert Gordon a traveler uh, government official he spoke hot and hot in 1777 <coughs> then there was a recording from 1846 from a missionary that again it wasn't it was looked upon as some sort of strange dancing. Maybe it's healing. Maybe it's religious, probably religious. Uh, then there was, in the 1870s, there was a magistrate going through the Lesotho Mountains. And they were actually searching for some uh, renegade sheep-stealing San in their perspective. And they came across some rock paintings. And he asked his guide, his Bushman guide, what are these rock paintings about? And for the first time, this explanation came back about this other, other sort of side to Bushman life. And these were rock paintings with uh, an strange sort of half human, half animal forms, people who are half snakes, uh, people that seem to be leading strange animals across the landscape. And pretty much at the same time, there was this philologist in Cape Town called Wilhelm Blake, and later his sister-in-law Lucy Lloyd and they were researching folklore about the Bushmen from a linguistic angle, angle at first but then it became more like a folklore study and they generated all this information an amazing repository about 13,000 half pages of notes about Bushman folklore so someone was suddenly extremely interested in folklore so they they Orpen started conversing with Blake and Lloyd from uh, the other sides of South Africa and this new sort of idea of 
uh, Bushman religion, it wasn't called shamanism then, was starting to develop. Um, then, it, then it died a little bit, and then it comes back again in the 1980s, which is where I'm heading. Uh, nothing mentioned about massage at all. There's a bit of rubbing. There's no, no sense of anything medical, healing, massage going on until 1917 is the first reference that I, I came across. So what's interesting about talking about shamanism in this context is that it, it's not typically associated with Africa. It's, it's associated with other parts of the world. Africa is the, the home of spirit possession, of witch doctors, of associated with voodoo. So, I mean, it's, it's all to do with the dark continent and the colonial images of Africa and creation of Africa. Uh, but there's this fundamental way of thinking about what goes on in Africa. So you had these people talking about shamanism in this sort of witch doctory land of Africa. So how did this conversation begin? It really developed with David Lewis Williams, who's an archaeologist. He's, um, he's, still, he's still going. He was born in 1934, so, but he's still writing away and, and very active. And he completely changed the field of rock art studies across the world. And he, his opening gambit was really his PhD, which was published as Believing and Seeing. And he said, essentially, that all the rock art, and there's a huge amount of rock art in southern Africa, incredibly elaborate rock art. It's, it's, if not all, it's mostly the product of people who have had shamanic experiences. And they are painting what they've seen. And some of this he describes as entoptics. So this is your, your dancing, and you get these images inside your head, and they can be squirrels and circles and lines and dots. So they're painting those images. They're, they're painting their experiences of people changing into animals and of dancing and invisible arrows being shot across healing circles. And the cover of his book is, is one of those rock paintings, and you can't quite see it, but these people are dancing, so they're dancing around in a circle, and there are arrows being shot around the circle. So his, he's started summarizing his approach, really, in the uh, late 80s, early 1990s, with a book on sand spirituality. Um, so that's his, that's his summary of what he does. So there's, a, there's an example of entoptics, just spots. Now, the idea has spread out across, across the world, and it's quite controversial how applicable it is to other contexts. But he's written on uh, prehistoric rock art, certainly in Europe, quite extensively. Now, in the 1980s, another man was picking up on this Blake and Lloyd connection, and that was Roger Hewitt, who wrote a book, Structure, Meaning, and Ritual in the Narratives of the Southern Sun. It was, again, his PhD. Um, and inside that, he focused in on something Blake and Lloyd had recorded called presentiments. Now, presentiments are feelings. They're not really described as feelings inside the Blake and Lloyd archive because it's written in this sort of late Victorian fashion and it's quite hard to uh, understand some, sometimes the language of it. But basically it describes how Bushmen feel where animals might be. They have a feeling of uh, the springbok being over the hill because they can feel maybe the blood that, of a dead springbok they once killed dripping down their back. or. Um, they can feel when changing into a lion, if there's a lion around, they can feel the, the uh, fur coming up on their back. And there, there's all sorts of ways of feeling where, what's going on in the world. But it's not, not really described as that. It's called this pre-sentiments. Now, for me, the whole word pre-sentiments, how can you have a pre-sentiment? How can you have a pre-feeling? I'm troubled by that. Um, but for me, the focus is on feelings. What, going on here is people listening to their bodies. And it's all about listening to their bodies. And this is where we're leading into massage and osteopathy, where to understand another body, what's the best way of understanding another body? Bringing a body towards it. That's how I think of it. Placing your hands, being around a body. It's not surprising you can smell it, you can feel it, you can, you can sense it, you can relate to it, you can mimic it. I mean, there's, there's this immediate, profound um, immersion with each other. And this is what's going on in Bushman context. And it's what's going on, these ideas of presentiments. There's a way of living in the world where you listen. You, you listen to 
something that's going to give you an opportunity, may mean nothing, uh, or you just want to check it out. And it's, it can be, if you start with the idea of hunting, I mean, hunting is so essential to, to sound life. They are hunter-gatherers. So you're in the bush, and you have, the first thing you have to do is, where's the wind? But you don't think, where's the wind? You know it because you're feeling it. You'll know straight away as you get up which way the animals are going to go, because when you were lying in bed that night, you probably heard the wind, and you know when the wind's blowing in that direction, the animals are going to go over that way. But it's a, it's a moonlit night, so they're actually going to be a lot more um, threatened by lions wandering around. So they're going to be over there on that night, but it's this end of the week. So the water hole is going to be filled up over here, and they filled the borehole. You know, there's this whole mass of uh, information going on uh, that they don't, they don't think about. They wake up in the morning and say, they probably don't say anything. They look at each other and head off. And there'll be a track, and they'll follow the track, and they're reading the track, and they're listening to the birds, and if the wrong bird says the wrong thing at the wrong time, then they're going to turn around and come home, even if they're hungry. If it says the right thing at the right time, they're up, and their blood's up, and they're going. Um, so it's this idea of listening. And for me, listening to the environment is listening to the body. There's a very close link. So this brings us back to... Bradford Keeney. We've gone through this sort of gentle uh, origins of shamanic thinking um, in this context. And then you get Bradford Keeney. He's a psychotherapist and he's, he's written some amazing books and uh, he spent a lot of time with the Bushmen and he's developed what you heard came from this. It's Shaking, the original path to ecstasy and healing. It's a six or seven CD course um, that introduces you into the world of being a Bushman healer. Uh, so he says it's all to do with shaking. And he was really the first one to say that. And he came from a background of ecstatic healing. I think his grandfather was a, an Episcopal minister. Uh, so he, again, was coming from his, his perspective. And he says when you, when you shake, you can summon up, or where you, where you open yourself up to the big love, essentially. The big love of God comes into you, and you shake, and you shake, and you shake, and it builds up inside you. And the Bushmen describe it as mum in the Juntuanzi, or tso, or in various other words. It builds up as a heat inside you, and it builds up and builds up, and then, boom, it explodes in your head. Uh, so Brad talks, talks a lot about this in a very specific context. To give you an idea of what Brad's talking about, let's just have a, lo a look at this. This is a film that someone else took a, and gave to me. So this is a, a sound group from probably northern Namibia. And it's, it's again, it's probably a recreated sort of living museum setting. But having said that, these guys are healers and they will heal amongst themselves. They wouldn't do it wearing the clothes that they're wearing, these are the clothes that they would have been wearing uh, maybe 60 years ago, where they are. Now, for some, you can see that the cameraman is fascinated by the shaking that's going on. Now, these guys, they shake in a very particular fashion. Not all healers shake in this way. This is a, this is a particular dance. It's called the, well, it's a variation of the elephant dance, where the women are in a half circle and the men are in the middle, and they shake and they shake, and they... They build up this heat inside them until it hits, their, hits them up in the head and then they are connected really with God, essentially. And then the, the power of God comes into them and they go around the community and heal. They generate the heat by going to the fire, pulling the fire and rubbing themselves with the heat. Uh, think about the physical contact there. He's rubbing his abdomen. This is where the gabezi is that uh, Brad Fakini was talking about in the very beginning, where you shoot the arrows. It's got to be nice and soft. Okay, so that's the shaking. We'll come back to it. So where do we go from Brad? What does Brad do, give, gives us? Well, he gives us this idea of the big love. He calls it the big love. He like, I think he likes to be controversial, um, which is, yeah, it's fine. It's actually quite nice to be in an academic setting and talk about the big love. You know, we never talk about things like that. Uh, um, and there's room for it. You know, one of the, the things that you can guarantee everybody is involved in and knows something about is love. But we just don't talk about it. So it's there. So for him, it's a, it's a connection with God, and it's open. 
So you open yourself up and he says, come on in, come on in. In this CD course, I sat in a caravan in um, a, camping, a campsite in, just outside Cape Town. Uh, and I thought I'd give this course a go. So I was there for a week playing this at night, going through the whole course. And it was, it was a very strange experience. And then I went up with the Bushman to see if it changed the way I thought about things. And it did, I think. Not the way he was probably thinking. Um, but um, a lot of it, he, say, he, he says you should write down on bits of paper, you know, come on in, come on in, hide it under your pillow. And then you've got to say, come on in when you're dancing and this great spirit will come in. But it's a receptivity. It's listening again. It's listening and, and saying, I'm, I, I'm open. You know, what's going on? And then you feel it. That's the next step. And then you feel it. And you can give it a name. And he's given it the name of the big love. And he says it's to do with the actual, it, well, he says it's, it's not the movement. It's what comes in that counts. But for me, there's an awful lot about the movement um, that generates certain sorts of feelings. You move in a certain sort of way. And I think you will get certain sorts of feelings. If you curl up in a ball and hide on the ground like this, you're not going to instantaneously feel happy and joyous. It's going to take you to places uh, where either psychologically or physically you've been curled up in a ball. Now, I'm being a little bit simplistic there. And there are muscle memory things we could talk about to explore that. But um, I don't want to go there at the moment. So healing the potency of God manifests inside the healer. Touch and movement are central. Um, this idea for him, it's, you get the shamanistic uh, side to it where the healer dances and dances and sometimes they travel out of themselves and they go up and they bring back the healing energy. This links into uh, going up to a village in, of God which the Blake and Lloyd collection talk about in a slightly different way. It's this older literature where you go up and you grab a rain animal and you lead it across the sky and you maybe cut the rain animal and then blood comes down or water comes down and rain comes down and gives life. Uh, but it, the, there is this idea that the healers, when they dance, go out of themselves. So that's, that's really the, you know, the, a very basic definition difference between spirit possession and shamanic, shamanism is one, you go out of yourself and spirit possession, you come in and you're ridden by the spirit, the spirits inside you. For the Bushman, it's somewhere, really, it's somewhere in between. And this is, I think, played down a bit. If you really look into what they say, they're really talking about things living inside you that speak and that wake up, things that come in, things that go out. And massage is all about taking things into the body and pulling them out again. Um, so the other, the other approach to the trance dance came from a slightly different angle, which was a much more sort of uh, traditional anthropological academic angle. First of all, Richard Lee and George Silberbauer wrote about it uh, from their work really in the late, well, 50s through the 60s. Then Richard Katz, who was also a psychotherapist, he uh, wrote this book, Boiling Energy, which is how most people heard about Bushman healing, certainly in the academic world. Uh, but this is, this is really their, a summary of their interpretations. It's a belief that uh, as a medical treatment has psychosomatic benefit. So it doesn't really work, it doesn't really do anything, except that it's an egalitarian mechanism for dealing with tension, stress, and social change. So everyone gets together, you know, you've had a, everyone's got a bit grumpy, you're in the middle of nowhere, there's only 10 of you. If you don't get on together, you're absolutely stuffed. Um, so you have to be brutal. You either get on together or, and someone said to me this to me the other day, he was telling me how his father said, well, when we were out in the bush, if somebody wasn't behaving, we would get together, we would talk, and then we would go and have a word with them. And we'd say, look, you're doing this, can you fix it? Then we would leave them, and then if they didn't fix the problem, we would kill them. <laughs> and people don't want to hear this. Um, I don't think for a moment he was exaggerating. I think when you're out there and things are mission critical, you don't muck around. Um, there are, you might push someone out of the community, but effectively that's the same thing. You need each other to survive. Dissipated skills, you can't survive on your own. Uh, so, but, so these guys are saying the dance is there to ease those tensions. You never want to get to that state. So you get together and you share this healing and all that tension dissipates. And they're, you know, they're absolutely right. Um, but it, again, it's only one aspect of it. 
Another guy is Matthew Gunter and Megan Beasley have, have written some amazing stuff in this as well. But they weren't really looking at the, the healing aspect as so much as the social aspect. So now we're getting round to the, the feely stuff. Well, I, I, I'll just tell you where I came from um, with, with my actual research was finding this one quote in this uh, Harvard journal, Harvard African Studies from 1918. And it says, according to the notions of anatomy, these organs have weird ways of wandering around the body. The treatment is massage to restore each organ to its proper place. In such massage, the Hottentots are very highly skilled. This to me said, organs wandering around the body, putting them back into place. You know, these are people who have an idea of what's in the body. Not only that, they have an idea of what should be there, what shouldn't be there, how it should be there, and how we can correct it. And nobody had, this didn't seem to tickle anything anywhere. Nobody had uh, picked up on this. So I, I, I based my PhD on this and went out to find out whether, whether anyone knew anything about this. And you know, within 10 minutes, I went up to a community in Seswantane in North Namibia and said, do organs wander around the body? And they said, of course they do. And you know, all of a sudden we were off. Um, do you massage? Of course we do. And it's, it was a... Uh, yeah, it was a uh, living, I suppose. <laughs> That's, that was me done for the next 20 years. Um, so, but what is this massage about? Mm. It's about potency. It's about the power of one thing to affect another. Uh, so what is potency? In thinking about potency, I mentioned this word num, this sort of energy inside, but there's many forms of potency, and it's, it's essentially taking the characteristics of something. So if it's a lion, it has the characteristics of a lion, and you give someone the potency of a lion inside them, then they can take on some of the strengths and the weaknesses of the lion. But as importantly, they have a relationship with lions. So that if you're out in the bush and you have lion potency inside you, you can communicate with the lions. You can also do it with wind. You can do it with rain. Uh, you can do it with other healers if you have healing potency that you share together. So you are one of them. That's the point. Now, in terms of spirit possession and shamanism, where it, what does that mean? Well, this thing actually lives inside you. And you can wake it up and it can talk to you. And you can listen to it. And it lives in certain places. The gabezi is one of them. It can live in the neck. Uh, it can live in the back, the bottom of the back. There are certain places. And you don't feel it until you dance and then it wakes up and talks to you. So this potency can have good and bad qualities. Uh, so working with this potency, that's how, what all the healing is about, whether it's taking plant medicines, taking animal medicines, whether it's wearing something that's a part of a lion, part of an eland, the massive antelope, which has such a critical role in Bushman life. Um, in terms of massage, you have one person with a set of potencies and another person with arguably a set of potencies that you want to change. Now, as a healer, I might be a healer who's had the sickness that they have, so I can treat that particular sickness. And healers tend to treat just very specific things. They don't, it depends which Bushman group you're talking about, they don't treat a whole range of things. They'll say, I'm good at treating this and I'm treating that, but no, not that one. But they will come to that person and they will share the potency with them by putting their hands on, often by putting them under their armpits, getting some sweat. Now, sweat carries your smell. Smell is your wind. Smell is who you are. So it, it equates to the idea of where we come from, the breath of life. Inside us, if we're dead, we have nothing. We're cold. And this, it, it sounds like a very matter-of-fact or obvious way of talking, but these ways of thinking are, are really critical once you stack them up to the way people people work in particular cultures. So something that is dead is cold, it's lying on the ground, it's not breathing. Something that is alive is warm, it breathes. What is the thing it's breathing? It's wind. It's like the wind that blows in the trees, but it's not quite the same. This wind can go into me, this wind can come from a bird and go into a baby and make them sick. This wind 
is the life of a person, so it is the person. It's also the smell of the person, because I know when I'm in the bush that there is an elephant over there, there's a rhino, there's a lion. How do I know? The smell of it, it can go into me. The smell of a snake can go into me and make me sick. If that smell goes into me, it can live inside me, like a story lives inside you. And sometimes the story is meaningless. It goes in and you don't know it's there until someone says something and that story wakes up and you remember it and it starts nagging at you and it starts talking to you. It smells the same thing. It lives inside you and it can wake up and it becomes alive and you start being your greater self, if you like. Uh, so as someone who massages, I will be waking up this particular power within me and I'll be applying it to someone. And at the same time, I'll be pulling out what they have inside them. Ways of communicating are, oh, as I said, you can rub sweat on, you can put your hands on, you can also use a stick. People sometimes use a stick and uh, the wind essentially, the essence moves up and down the stick. Uh, you can look at someone, just by looking at them, you can send potency into them. You can have bad thoughts. Bad thoughts come out of your mouth and they live inside you and they live in your heart or in your throat and they talk to you and they eat you away until you die. This stuff's inside you, so you have to pull it out. So when you see healers in this shamanic trance healing dance, touching, rubbing, this is all what's behind what they're doing. They're working with these potencies, just as when you see people massaging, which we shall come to. There's also an, an idiom, open the road of someone. If somebody gives you something to wear in South Africa, a bushman, particularly in South Africa, be a little bit careful. Because that thing might be something that's going to open your road, or it might be something that's going to close your road. And for some reason, a lot of people have said to me, that guy, that woman gave you that thing because they wanted to close your road. They wanted to close you down. And whether it's jealousy, and jealousy does exist, and it's a, it's a big thing. I mean, we all have jealousy, but it does seem to be accentuated in these contexts. Um, so you do get given things, uh, and you have to be a little bit careful. Or people will give you things that say, I'll give you this and I'll do this because it's going to open your road. And they think the same way about the body. It's like blockages in the body. I'm going to open your body so the wind can move through your body. Uh, it's looseness is also associated with this idea of things moving smoothly through the body. So they will look for knots, they will look for lumps, they will look for gaps in the joints. I think we go back to the idea of these smelly substances that were recorded way back in the, the 1600s. Rubbing on smelly substances, python fat, that's a great one for rubbing on. If you want to walk through the bush and you don't want to be bitten by any snakes, python is the king of the snakes. So you rub it all over your legs. And it's not just the smell, although it is the smell, it's actually that you become the snake. So you have a relationship with a snake. And as the king of snakes, other snakes know that you're a snake. So they're not going to trouble you. Um, sa or buchu, th these are plants that I crop up throughout the literature uh, that Bushman cultures use to rub onto people to change their condition. Uh, you can also use it to the rain, to calm down the rain. Uh, but you use it around the healing dance. You, you pop some under the nose and it opens up your mind. The striped polecat. This was from uh, David Kraper. He was the, he's now sadly deceased, uh, leader of the Kamani Bushmen. And David Kraper told me that when he was young, a healer grabbed a polecat and grabbed its bottom and wiped it down its face. <laughs> now, the polecat is quite a smelly animal. <laughs> the back end of the polecat is particularly smelly. It's the anal gland of the polecat. I mean, that is potent. And this is what he was doing as a healer. He was generating this potency. He was alive. And you smell this stuff and you're alive. And it does link into smelling, Victorian smelling salts. You know, smell has a, it's all, it wakes you up. And as a healer, you have to be awake. You have to be listening. Uh, so those are, when I think about massage amongst the Bushmen, this is what I'm thinking about. Moving organs in the body. The, the organs do move amongst the high clum they move a lot more than amongst the Junkwanzi and the Naro and other groups. But uh, particularly the uterus can move up and move into the head. The heart drops down. If the heart drops down, it's a very serious problem. You get uh, depression, bad dreams. The aortic artery is a really important one that runs right the way through the communities. The aortic artery moves to the side. 
Now you can feel it, if you, if you really press, you can feel this thing, and not surprisingly, they translate it as the pumpy pumpy. But if the pumpy pumpy moves, this is really serious. So you have to massage the pumpy pumpy back into place. Um, and we'll see this in a moment. Uh, so tightness, gapping, keeping things moving. That's what they're doing. Now, let's just have a look at this. Now, okay, this is, this is a film that I actually made back in 2001 on a really old camera. Um, wh what I want to do is just move through to... Uh, I'm not... The sound... Let's, let's just have a look here. I'm not sure where the sound control is. Here is it. I mean, the sound, the sound's not so... That's nice enough. Okay, this is a Damra group healing, but this, this is just a very quick reference shot. Um, what I actually want to show you is... Uh, okay, th what I did was contrast four different types of healers. Now, this is a guy who's a Heiklum healer, sitting around in the night. So cameras, even you know, in 2001, it was really hard to get a camera that filmed in the dark. Um, so this has a slightly sort of otherworldly quality to it, which is not entirely inappropriate. Uh, so these guys, instead of standing up, the healer is in the center and he's moving around and he's leaning over people and he's sucking the sickness out of them. He's now got the sickness inside him and he's rubbing him. Can you see how he's, he's rubbing? And then he's got to expel it, spells it into his hands, flings it away. The sickness is going to enter the top of his head, which is a, which is a particularly open place. So he has this sickness inside him, he takes it on and then he's got to get rid of it and sometimes it overcomes them. And then the way to get them back, because they've gone out, is to massage, to rub the body. his hands to rub it and he pulls the sickness out. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move through to some other examples that are more... Just see the rubbing there. This is all... So these things are living, they're going to live inside him unless he gets them right. Um, he's pulling the sickness into him and if that sickness lives inside him, he'll die. So he has to get this out and they do that by loosening him up so that he can bring up this uh, ability to throw the sickness out. That's what it's all about and that's exactly what's going on with massage when you put your hands on. Among some of the Nama, when you, they massage, they belch the whole time, big, loud burps. And it's, they, they say it's the wind of the person coming out and they're releasing it. They sometimes describe it as arrows coming out. When you put your hands on, you rub it and you pull the arrows out. Um, so we'll just move through to other healers. Um, this is a, a group up in Namibia.
So this is called the giraffe dance. And here you can really see the circle where they move around the circle, uh, putting healing essence into everyone. So here he's pulling it out of a baby, rubbing on the back of someone. There's a moth cocoon rattles to get, to get the feel, get you open. Did you see the squeezing of the head there? Squeeze the head and then pfft, you can suck out the sickness. So there's a sense in which you, you gather that sickness in the person and then you pull it. Okay. And now, this is a uh, much more recent, well, actually it wasn't that much more recent, it was 2007. Um, this is another kind of, now, what they would describe as a, a massage, essentially. If you think about the way he, the way he holds the head, the way he compresses the head, releases it, the way he moves his hands around the torso, where he's rubbing. But here he's specifically going for the joints. Now watch what this person does. You saw him there go kiki. It's very important. Okay, so at the, at the end there, you saw him. Boom, he's throwing it up. He's throwing that sickness out. And when he's he's feeling it, he's pulling that sickness and he's settling it. He's getting it to the right place. He's working with that potency that's inside him. The difference is, in some ways, he's dealing with joints there and tissues, whereas in a trance healing setting, they're dealing with, uh, it's, it's another kind of potency, it's another kind of thing, uh, but it's dealt with in the same way and it's conceptualized fundamentally in the same way. Uh, it's a problem inside someone that needs to come out. He gets hold of this problem and he makes this problem sit nicely inside someone. Um, things sitting nicely inside someone are, are a very important way of thinking about it. So I've got one, I've got one last film. Have we, we've got time for... Oh, don't worry. Yeah, so... So this is a film that I actually put together for the museum. And it's, it's a summary of what goes on now. So again, this isn't quite now. It was... To, uh, 2012, I think I, I took this, and it's amongst a community in South Africa where they, they do what they call smear in Afrikaans, the smear. Now, all over the, the Nama, uh, the, all the Basta people of South Africa, the Griqua, uh, there's this smear techniques, and the Bushmen as well. And it's, well, you'll see what it is. It's essentially a massage using Vaseline. The idea of Vaseline is important. They would use fat if they had it, but they'll use Vaseline. But there are, there are lots of important things you do with the Vaseline. Like you mustn't put the pot back on while you're treating someone because that will make them sick. Uh, but if you see what, what happens in the next video, then 
hopefully you'll see continuity in the way people are treating the body. It's just a slightly different focus. They're moving into, as I said, into joints and specific, more specific sort of stiffness problems thought of in terms of blockages, gaps, something living inside you, something that needs to come out. Perhaps it's wind. Perhaps it's wind that's in the stomach, so it can be that literal wind, or perhaps it's that wind in the body that you have to, you have to get it and you have to fling it out. So I'm, I'm not saying that this is uh, an untouched, ancient Bushman way of healing, because there's obviously a rich historical context behind everything we've seen, the trance dancing as much as anything else. And the more you learn about these areas, the richer that ideas of contact and flow and identity, it's incredibly complex. There are, there are things passing amongst different sorts of people in that region for you know, thousands of years. Uh, but this is where she's concentrating on this pumpy pumpy that I told you about. So she's feeling where it is and she, she'll move it back into place if it's in the wrong place. So it's the same as what was being written about in 1918. So some of this, there's no doubt some sort of familiarity with massage in an introduced post-colonial colonial context. But the essence of it is about moving organs it's about wind, it's about gaps, it's about local ideas of paralysis. Now here's, here's another example of the Zhung Tuang. So the guy just before this one was Zhung Tuang. And for me, this is extraordinary. You know, I, it, I could be doing this virtually. But the, the way he focuses on this particular joints, it looks like it's quite loose, but he's very specific. The way he winds up the body to the point of tension, and then he'll get a, a little release out of it. And so much of this is to do with that little release, whether it's a release of an arrow going in or something coming out. It's the body realigning itself. It's the body being vulnerable for a moment. And once you juggle all the bits in a the body, they tend to come back in places that, where they, sh they belong. Cracking of joints is important. Getting, getting that pop, uh, which, you know, for people who have visited osteopaths, that pop is quite sort of, has some notoriety, whether it's good or bad. Some people want their money back if they don't get a pop. <laughs> which is tri tricky, because you don't really want to pop them, but, you know, business. <laughs> I didn't say that. So at the end of that, he, he took it and he flung it out. So really what I'm saying that what he was doing was getting things back into their right place. And as an osteopath, that's, that's, that's really where you begin. You hopefully know the body, know bodies so intimately that 
you know what's normal. You know the normal, so what's abnormal? And this is something like when you walk through the bush and you know the bush so intimately. You know where this animal is. You know what that sound is. You know what that smell is. What's abnormal? And it's when you get the abnormal, then you focus in on it. And in some ways, you throw everything up in the air. You, can, you, either, you either take the body to a place where it says, whoa, what, what's this? I haven't, you know, I've been trying to ignore this problem here. Um, there's something there, and the body responds to it. Uh, they're doing the same thing. The person coming to the body is listening to that body. He'll talk about being able to see what's inside the body, but he's feeling the whole of that body, and he's saying, right, this should be here, this should be here, and he's just working with his hands. And for me, the training, perhaps the training of a shaman, sums, sums up what they're doing. If, you, if you're in one of those healing dances, you get chopped, you get swatted, you get your um, ears blown, someone may bring a log, and a burning log, and stick it in your face, someone may get a stone, drag it down your back, you become like this, you become super wired, you become absolutely like this. So if somebody goes, boo, you know, you're, whoa. And that's to do with this, this being open, and that's when the arrow is thrown into you, and you're receptive. And this has a particular energy that goes in. Um, so that's really all I want to say about it, that when you know the bigger context, then something takes on uh, completely different dimensions. And we all come with very blinkered ideas, blinkered eyes. Um, but you know, when you open them up and get that context, and this is a very culturally specific context, um, but where we, link, we all link in is the body.